Hey there, welcome back to week 7 of the Constitutional Studies course. In lecture 1 of this course, we focused on the right to life, especially the deprivation of the right to life. We looked at issues like the death penalty, euthanasia, abortion, and suicide. In this second lecture, we're going to turn to the positive dimensions of the right to life looking beyond the question of deprivation, looking at the right to life as affirming a fuller life in with, along various dimensions. In this lecture, we will cover the cases around prison conditions, labor conditions, around which the broader argument for a positive right to life, that enhanced life conditions emerged. We then look at some critical cases around food, health, shelter and livelihood which have uh, had significant impact on the law and policy of this country in the last three decades. We will close with two newer rights around education which is now Article 21A, it's uh, amended into the constitution and the right of environment which gets closely tied up with discussions around development. We will conclude this lecture and this week with a focus on the new frontiers around the right to life, which is the right to privacy. And you will see that this, this new dimension of the right to life uh, promises, like the, the positive dimension of the right to life which emerged in the 70s and the 80s, to take us into new spaces in the 21st century. So let's get started with how the positive dimensions to the right to life emerged. That would need us to go back into the late 70s and the early 80s. Just to move things along, I'm going to begin with an important case in the 80s dealing with prison conditions called Francis Corrali versus the Union Territory of Delhi. In this case, a person was detained on drug charges and placed in a prison under pretty difficult conditions. And Francis Corrali petitioned the court that not only were the prison manual conditions not being satisfied, but then even if they were satisfied, that the conditions in the prison were so appalling that the court needed to intervene. The court relied on a very early decision of the US Supreme Court in 1876 in a case called Munn versus Illinois. I'm not going to go into great detail about what happened in Munn, Munn v. Illinois, except to point out a key phrase that gets repeated over and over again in the Indian debates around the right to life. By the term life, as here used, something more is meant than mere animal existence. The inhibition against its deprivation extends to all those limbs and faculties by which life is enjoyed. So when a constitution says no person shall be deprived of the right to life, we need not construe the term life as meaning simply life or death. It can extend to all other faculties or other facets of life that, that are meaningful for, for a life well lived. This kind of expansion of the concept of life is what we see occurring in the Francis Corrali case. And Francis Corrali, uh, and I'll just read the highlighted portion to emphasize how this, uh, this argument developed, the court concluded that not only does the right to life include the right to the basic necessities of life, but the right to life also included the right to carry on such functions and activities as constitute the bare minimum expression of the human self. What might this mean in a prison? This might mean an access to reading material, magazines, newspapers. This might mean an access to writing material the ability to express yourself. This might mean an access to community spaces in a prison, as well as an access to the outdoors, 
uh, for for basic conditions of life that one might assume that the deprivation of civil liberty that imprisonment is about might exclude all of these but the court and justice bhagwati in particular was was concluded that no while imprisonment certainly meant the deprivation of the basic liberty to move about in society at large it did not mean that you could be confined to 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 make the make the point strong you could be confined like an animal so that was the early move of in the court to develop a concept of life that went beyond protecting uh, uh went beyond cases which 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 uh, raised issues relating to the deprivation of life so let's move along and see where we go next once again it's justice bhagwati but in a very different uh, background this time dealing with bonded labor and the conditions of work once again the issue was uh, related to contract labor that was employed in various uh, quarries almost in uh, bonded labor conditions uh, that the court was concerned about and it came before the court in a petition justice bhagwati did well to combine an, an an expansion of the right to life by looking at several directive principles in the constitution he looked at directive principles that dealt with the health and strength of workers uh, looked at directive principles that dealt dealt with the protection of children and the provision of uh, uh, of educational facilities to children as well as directive principles that emphasize humane conditions of work and what justice bhagwati concluded was that these cases that of of near bonded labor were cases that offended these conditions and the failure of the state to ensure that these basic minimum conditions were met was a violation of the right to life remember once again that in no circumstance was it alleged that someone had been had been put to death by the conditions of work the court is emphasizing that life the deprivation of life is not merely the deprivation of life by putting one to death but by the deprivation of the basic humane conditions of life on which uh, a, a reasonable uh, life can be built so the first case that we looked at was a case relating to prison conditions in the second case we looked at labor conditions so now we understand that the right to life in the indian constitution certainly covers these two background conditions the court has later late into the 1990s and in the early part of the 20th 21st century been particularly concerned and strong about the, the protection or the creation of a right to food some of the early cases included pucl versus union of india which was in writ petition 196 of 2001 broadly the 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 case uh, is broadly known as the right to food case and has very many dimensions and continued over a long period of time and several orders were issued but before we we uh, get into the quotation and try and understand uh, what the court was saying about the right to life please understand that in this case the court intervened to provide midday meals for children in schools the court intervened to ensure that famine and starvation relief was provided in various parts of, of india uh, both in normal times and in cases of disasters the court intervened to ensure that adequate uh, supplementation of nutrition was was provided to to uh, to to pregnant women and young mothers Uh, and so on and so forth so the as well as articulating a basic minimum entitlement of food that should be legally protected so a sort of freedom from from hunger as being integral to the protection of the right to life in the quotation what you pick up is that the court is clear that the 
provisioning of food to the aged, to the infirm, to the disabled, to destitute men and women who are in danger of uh, starvation um, is integral to the, to the right to life. And an argument by the state that it does not have either the grain or the ability to distribute this food is not accepted by the court. The court is clear that whatever else the state must do, it must provide for this basic freedom from hunger. As many of you are no doubt aware, this case wound its way through the courts across two decades and then in 2013, a National Food Security Act was enacted which crystallized many of the court decisions into concrete entitlements that were to be delivered by the state. The implementation of the National Food Security Act has been modest to reasonable depending on the state that you look at. But today, uh, Indian citizens have an entitlement to basic food arising out of the litigation in court and the interpretation of Article 21. Going beyond food, the court has been very concerned about health care. As you can tell in politics around the world, the access to health care becomes a critical ingredient of a good life or a reasonable life. The Indian courts have approached the question of health care in two ways. First, with respect to the provisioning of emergency medical care. In these cases, as in Parmanan Katara, the, the hesitation was of private sector providers initially to accept cases where there were accidents and where there, were, uh, there was a need for emergency health care two, for two reasons. First, that several legal complications might occur in, by providing uh, immediate and urgent medical health care, um, which the private hospitals did not want to take on. The second was that um, the, the parties might not have the capacity to pay. Once uh, the health care was provided, emergency health care was provided, who would pick up the tab? In the absence of a national medical insurance or a national health ins insurance, uh, these bills would remain unpaid. While the court did not address the question of insurance very carefully and the, and the payment of bills, um, the court was very clear that whatever medical legal complications might arise out of emergency health care must be done away with. No private hospital could be, uh, could, could be allowed to deny emergency health care. Even if legal complications were to arise, the, the courts and the police should not entangle the providers of, of emergency health care in these kinds of um, issues. So this issue was settled in Parmanan Katara. Much else has been done on this question. Uh, and you will see the 201st report of the Law Commission of India, which was prepared in August 2006, argued for the enactment of a Good Samaritan law, uh, which allows for emergency medical assistance either by those uh, who are bystanders or by medical professionals. And these, uh, these laws have now taken shape. The second dimension of healthcare is non-emergency healthcare. And, and here litigation has, has been less successful. Though in isolated cases like the Pashtun Banga Kate Mazur Samiti case, the court was willing to consider access to timely medical care uh, as being a, an essential part of Article 21, the court has not paid enough attention to the institutional architecture by which healthcare is provided. We have not seen sustained litigation either on the institutional architecture of the public health system or on a public insurance system that would ensure that all citizens would be entitled to basic levels of health care across the country. 
The executive branch of government has made far more progress than the courts in this matter and the creation of, of broad schemes of medical insurance like Ayushman Bharat and far more efficient and effective state level schemes which have wide applicability have resulted in uh, a, a rapid expansion of levels of health care across the, the Indian population. So health was another issue where the court by embracing access to health care as a part of the right to health in the earliest stages uh, in, in, in the 1990s, the court has brought that agenda to the fore of public discourse and has led to sustained legislative and executive action. So we have covered food and health and you might ask what would come next uh, and not surprisingly the next uh, critical question has become shelter. Now it might be that you might uh, one might argue that the right to life must include the right to a home. The court has not gone that far. The initial cases that came before the court was of deprivation of the ability to either live on in, in, in the streets or in unauthorized residential settlements, slums or similar such structures. Um, in the early cases, the court was, was willing to, to accept that the, that the right to life would protect one against the deprivation even where you don't have adequate legal title to the uh, to the land or to the home that you occupy. However, subsequent cases have, have diluted that position in several ways and today what we might be able to say is that we have a right to shelter, reasonable accommodation and the protection against deprivation, but we don't have an affirmative right to a certain, uh, you know, a certain defined, specified quality of housing. Let's see what the court has to say in Shanti, Shanti Star Builders in 1990. The court affirms that the basic needs of man have traditionally been accepted to be food, food, clothing and shelter. The right to life, it reminds us, in any civilized society should include the right to food, the right to clothing and the right to a decent environment and reasonable accommodation. This, it appears, flows from the distinction between an animal existence and a human civilized existence. And that suitable accommodation is essential for our physical, mental and intellectual well-being. Even if the state is unable to provide well-built, comfortable homes, the court concludes, it must be able to provide us provide every person in India a reasonable accommodation that that would certainly uh, you know that one might have legal title and entitlement to as well as what sustains us to have a meaningful life. This is very a very broad proposition not disagreeable but much would much of the, uh, the doubts would arise from the details. And the Indian courts have not been very effective at specifying what exactly the right to housing entails and the, and the court and that is pretty much where we are even at this point. While the executive government has developed several schemes um, along providing affordable housing as well as constructing uh, houses for, for the poor and the deprived. The question of housing in India's urban centers, especially overcrowded urban centers, remains a crushing and urgent question that deserves the attention of the court. So even if you had housing and you had food uh, and you had some protection of health care, do we have a right to livelihood? Do we have the right to work, in other words? And this came up in a very early case called Olga Telles vs. Bombay Municipal Corporation in 1985. This is a curious case where the Bombay Municipal Corporation wanted to evict 
pavement dwellers who were residing um, in, um, in 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 the on the pavement in Mumbai, as we have seen, uh, as many of us have seen, either individually, personally, or in in the movies, we know that many Indian cities have uh, slums both on the pavements and off uh, the main roads of cities. The question was whether the Bombay Municipal Corporation could evict these these slum dwellers um, without providing them an alternative accommodation. And the court went into this in some detail. What is striking about the court's uh, rationale and its reasoning was that while no one has a fundamental right to live on the pavement or on any piece of land, access to livelihood, which um, emerges from living close to places of work, is a very important part of the protection under Article 21. Even if pavement dwellers were removed from the pavements and placed, say, 10, 15 or 20 kilometers away from their current places of residence, it would mean that they had no protection, um, no source of livelihood would ultimately render them destitute. So the court was very sympathetic to the idea that we have a right to livelihood and that we should, um, that the court will not allow the Bombay Municipal Corporation to deprive uh, the right to livelihood of the pavement dwellers in this case. If we have crossed concerns of livelihood, what must closely follow are concerns around education. The early education cases, both Mohini Jain and Oni Krishnan in 1992 and 1994, were cases that dealt with higher education. Uh, often, uh, students who sought to secure admissions in medical colleges or engineering colleges would litigate the matter and the court often found that it, 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 it espoused language more broadly protecting a right to education, not just a right to higher education. In fact, it's the right to primary and secondary education and high school education that is protected by the right to life in a, in a substantive way and higher education may well not be a fundamental right of all citizens. So what, what did the court do? The court made it clear that educational institutions at all levels, yeah, primary, secondary, high school, as well as higher education institutions must recognize that citizens have a right to education, a constitutional right, and that the state has a mandate to provide these educational opportunities. This body of litigation eventually led to the 86th Amendment Act in 2002 and the, Ar and, and the insertion of Article 21A. Now, this article was already a, a, a director principle of state policy and so its introduction into the constitution is a fundamental right, may or may not in, 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 in a very significant way change the texture of constitutional argument. In any event, let's read the article. The state shall provide free and compulsory education to all children from the, of the age 6 to 14 years in such manner as the state may by law determine. And the state has determined the, uh, by law the Right to Education Act. What, what is the nature of education to be provided uh, for this age group, 6 to 14 years? So the Right to Education Act itself ha had a fair bit of litigation where the court went into the boundaries of what is and is not protected but the right to education. But for an introductory course like this, I am not going to uh, go into all of those details. But for those of you who are, who are interested, you might want to focus on the Section 12 mandate in the Right to Education Act, which imposes some obligations on private actors, private schools, as a part of the right to education. Many of you would be familiar with a serial litigant uh, in the Supreme Court on environmental matters, uh, M.C. Mehta. 
So MC Mehta, as a lawyer, filed several cases before the Supreme Court on a range of matters, vehicular pollution uh, in New Delhi, the Taj Mahal case, the Ganga pollution case, the Bias River, the oleum gas leak case, and so on. And what MC Mehta, and this was, he was ahead of his time making these arguments in the late 70s and the 80s and right through till now, was arguing that we all have the right to a pollution-free environment in our, under Article 21. The court, though initially tentative in embracing such a broad right, has eventually come to accept that indeed such a right exists. In the Velour Citizens Forum case, the court went further. It recognized the principle of sustainable development. Development that does not compromise on the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Such a concept of intergenerational equity, whatever else you might say, was not anticipated by the, the framers of the Constitution when they drafted Article 21. The court has also imported two important principles of environmental law. The first, the precautionary principle, so when the full uh, dimensions of, of a development intervention are not known, the, 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 the court must balance the risks in favor of caution. And second, that whatever else may happen um, by, the, by, by a particular intervention, a polluter must pay for any damage that they cause to the environment. And these two principles have been embraced by the Supreme Court, though more detailed versions of these are available in the environmental statutes. The Velour Citizens Welfare Forum is an important case, but I suppose that as all of us are now staring at uh, uh, the prospect of dramatic climate change uh, and global warming, we, we must confront the possibility that there can be a serious uh, body of litigation that seeks to protect the, 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 the world from these unimaginable consequences arising, arising out of global warming. Uh, some of you may be familiar that in Europe and elsewhere, some early litigation by young school children have yielded uh, quite remarkable results. And maybe India must brace for such an approach to, to, to spur the government to tackle the questions of climate change with the urgency that they deserve. All of that would be Article 21 litigation should it occur. So this broad survey of the various dimensions of the right to life, the positive dimensions of the right to life, brings us to conclude with, the, with where is the right to life litigation going? You, you would remember that in lecture one, I presented a broad uh, historical outline in slide one about how the right to life first uh, focused on the, on the phrase procedure established by law, then subsequently has focused on the, on the phrase right to life, life as being more than just the deprivation of life, but its positive dimensions. In recent years, the court has now developed a new doctrine of the right to life and we might do well to pay some attention to it as it appears that this is going to be the future of the right to life litigation, much of the right to life litigation that we will confront. In the very early cases in the 60s and 70s, 1960s and 70s, uh, police surveillance and home visits were challenged and these cases went all the way to the Supreme Court. And, but the Supreme Court did not articulate a strong right of privacy, you know, a right of privacy that prevented police surveillance um, uh, of, of individuals without a warrant and also visits to people's homes. So the court uh, articulated a version of it, but not a very strong version of the right to privacy. But in the 1990s, the court seems to have changed its mind and, and started to develop a right to privacy 
in the forced interrogation cases. These were mostly cases that dealt with truth serum and other forms of medical legal interrogation that the court felt was a breach of the privacy of the individual who was subjected to these criminal interrogation techniques. But when it came to the UID, the, the, the Aadhaar cases, the court has embraced this challenge squarely and in Puttuswami 1 and 2, has, the court has reformulated a right to privacy. Now, what do we mean by the right to privacy? The right to privacy at the minimal level simply means the right to be left alone. Just leave me alone, uh, no state interference, uh, I get to do what I, uh, I want to do. Uh, it might, in, in a right to, right to be left alone formula, it might mean that it's a freedom from surveillance. Um, but the court goes much further in these cases. And the, it goes much further because in the Aadhaar cases, the court thinks that this is an affront to our dignity protections. That the dignity of human beings requires the protection of their privacy and in 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 these new technological arenas these these infringements of privacy can become very severe and have uh, outsized implications so what kinds of protections the right to privacy protects my right to make decisions both about my body as well as about my personal life so gender sexuality as well as maybe issues related to abortion, uh, or as well as my right to express myself in various ways, may all be covered. And my right to make life decisions about, about uh, marriage, education, work, are all protected by the, the dignity and privacy of individuals. The second uh, kind of autonomy would be an autonomy about information. That is information related to me, uh, information about me may all need to be protected by the state and by private actors in ways that ensure that my dignity and privacy are protected. Certainly the right to be left alone, which is arguably the lowest threshold of the right to privacy and dignity. So all of these dimensions, new dimensions, and there are more, I'm not uh, going to sketch all of the potential dimensions of the right to privacy and dignity, but all of these dimensions are now guarded or they're, you know, uh, fenced off by a new proportionality test, where the court will always ask a few questions about any state intervention into one's privacy and dignity. First, it will ask, is this even, uh, is, is, is this uh, even necessary? Why, why, why are we even doing this, uh, making this intervention? Is, is the Aadhaar UID serving any significant public purpose? Second, the court will ask, is the intervention or the interference with your right to privacy or dignity uh, necessary in a democratic society? Can it be justified? Is it a valid purpose? And it will ask, can this be more narrowly tailored? Can you do this? Can you do this in some other way? Can you achieve the outcome that you seek to achieve using some other technique which does not offend the privacy and dignity of individuals? Now the proportionality test, and I'm describing it in a very uh, general sense, uh, uh, in, as, as in a non-legal sense, if I, if I may add, uh, is often described as a three-step or a four-step test depending on the jurisdiction that one might focus on. But it appears that privacy and dignity along with the proportionality test can tackle a whole range of cases that we uh, dealt with in, in prior to uh, Puttaswami 1 and 2 using a different doctrinal framework. It also seems that the new uh, the range of new cases coming up before the Supreme Court may well be phrased in this way. And uh, this might become the new dimension of the right to life in the Indian Constitution. So let me stop here. 
and summarize, briefly summarize what we have done in lecture 1 and 2 of week 7. We have focused on the right to life. We initially began with deprivations of the right to life. In the second lecture, we focused on positive dimensions of the right to life. We've concluded by taking a brief look at how privacy and dignity may well become the most important facet of the right to life that will be protected by the Supreme Court. That covers this week's lectures on the right to life. In week 8, I will come back to uh, the right to liberty and then to the right to equality. Till then, have a great week. Bye.